Hi, this is Mrs. Bernasconi, and we are going to talk today about the five factors that can cause a population to change over time in terms of evolution. Now, the five factors we're talking about will move a population out of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Remember that Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium says that the frequency of alleles isn't changing. In order for that to be satisfied, the population has to be static. There are five factors that can cause us to move away from Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and in fact demonstrate that the population is changing over time through its frequency of alleles. So if we look right here, our five factors are mutation, migration, meaning gene flow. Remember that there are two parts to migration. We'll also talk about non-random mating, which comes in two varieties. Uh, we're talking about inbreeding here. And we're also talking about non-random uh, mating in terms of sexual selection. Beyond that, we'll also talk about genetic drift, which is mostly due to chance and um, deals with factors such as the bottleneck effect, as well as the founder effect. And last but not least, we'll begin our discussion of natural selection. So let's get started. Now, recall that mutation is the ultimate source of all variation in a population. And mutations tend to happen spontaneously. Now, when we're talking about mutations that are affecting a population, we're talking about um, point mutations right now, not so much mutations um, as in um, translocations or losing sections of chromosome. We're talking about small changes which given generation time can really add up to make a difference. Now recall for a mutation to make a difference it has to affect a phenotype that is going to in turn affect that organism's survival either by conveying an advantage or a disadvantage. So that you can imagine that this is a relatively slow process to accumulate mutations in the right genes at the right time. And yet, even small changes can have the potential to make drastic consequences. So if we're talking about mutation, the three types of mutation that we're speaking about here are additions of nucleotides. We're also talking about deletions of nucleotides and substitutions. And it's this idea of a substitution that I want to draw our attention to, our favorite molecule by far to talk about mutation, and that is hemoglobin. Now, hemoglobin, as you recall, is a molecule that's responsible for carrying uh, oxygen in your red blood cells and transporting it around your body. Now, hemoglobin functions beautifully. In fact, it's highly conserved throughout the animal kingdom because it does function so efficiently. However, there is a simple, small substitution in a single nucleotide, a single point mutation, within the normal hemoglobin molecule, which gives rise to the disease sickle cell anemia. One small change of substituting in okay, valanine, substituting in valanine instead of the original glutamic acid, causes the molecule structure, that protein hemoglobin, to now have a hydrophobic pocket. And that hydrophobic pocket is going to stick to other hemoglobin molecules. So instead of our red blood cells being this nice round plump shape, when the hemoglobin starts to stick to itself, it's going to make those red blood cells sickle and form rods. And that, in turn, doesn't carry as much oxygen, gets stuck in the finer capillaries of the blood vessels, and therefore you have tissues that are not getting the oxygen they need in order to complete cellular respiration. Now, you may say, if sickle cell anemia is so bad, and it's been around for such a long time, why does it still exist? And the answer for why anything still exists is that it must provide some sort of advantage. So if we're thinking about um, sickle cell anemia, there are a few places where we see it more prevalent in populations than others. We see it often in, <clears throat> excuse me, in Africa. We see it in South America. And both of these places have something in common. They both are places where mosquitoes often carry the plasmodium, which causes malaria. And malaria is um, a pretty devastating parasitic disease that the plasmodium that causes it infiltrates the red blood cells and causes them to lice. And you can imagine, since your red blood cells are really important for transporting oxygen around your body, that having your red blood cells lice is not a good thing. So, Okay, 
we have this high prevalence of sickle cell um, trait in Africa and South America that coincidentally is also a place where we have a high degree of malaria. Well, as it turns out, there's an advantage for being a heterozygote for sickle cell anemia. The advantage is that if you are a heterozygote for sickle cell anemia, or if you have, let me back up, if you have the sickle cell trait, that is you have the mutated hemoglobin, you are immune to malaria, okay? You are immune to malaria. This is called the heterozygote advantage. So if we can imagine our hemoglobin for a minute, we have normal and we have abnormal hemoglobin. And if we think of the normal hemoglobin as being represented by capital N, because normal is dominant, and we think about lowercase n as being the sickle cell hemoglobin. Now there's three possible genotypes you can be. You could be capital N, capital N. You can be a heterozygote, or you can be homozygous for the recessive. If you consider this, well, this is a good trait to be because you will be, you have normal hemoglobin. However, you can get malaria. If you consider the other homozygous trait, you have abnormal hemoglobin, therefore you can get sickle cell anemia. However, you are immune to malaria, so no malaria. Is there a compromise? An immunity to malaria and normal blood, and there is, and that is the heterozygote advantage. If you are heterozygous for the sickle cell trait, you're enough of your red blood cells are normal shaped because you have enough normal hemoglobin and because some of your red blood cells sickle, you also are immune to malaria. So we see a high prevalence of this heterozygote genotype in places that have a lot of malaria. Now the consequence of this is if we think back to our genetics, uh, what's the probability of two parents who are heterozygous having a, ch a child that also has this resistance. And if we do add our good old Punnett square, we can see that these two parents have a 50% chance of having a child with that heterozygote advantage. But they also have a 25% chance of having a child normal but susceptible to malaria and a 25% chance of having a child susceptible to sickle cell anemia, which can be a truly devastating disease. So mutations can cause change in populations. So how often do they occur? Before we go there, let's make sure we have a couple of these pieces of terminology straight. When we say a trait is selected for, what is it that we're really saying? Well, selected for means that the trait is favorable and that the environment is encouraging it. Therefore, we're going to see an increase in frequency over time. If a trait is selected against, that means it is unfavorable again as determined by the environment and we should see a decrease in frequency over time because natural selection is going to weed it out. So how prevalent is mutation? Well mutation does impact about one out of every 10,000 nucleotides and it is the ultimate source of genetic variation. But in order for it to really make a change in a generation time period, you have to accumulate enough mutations in that gene of interest. So from a generation to generation standpoint, it really is not um, a significant or a frequent contributor to change in that population. But remember that it is the ultimate source. So if mutation didn't exist, we would all be clones and we'd all have very little genetic diversity and therefore there would be nothing for natural selection to act upon. The second factor that can affect um, a population and move it out of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is migration. And migration, we're really talking about gene flow. So the movement of genes between populations. And we can impact that, well, genes don't just walk away by themselves. We actually have to talk about immigration, so that is organisms coming into a population, so that is coming into a population. So that is my grandparents immigrated to the United States and they emigrated from Italy. So emigration is leaving a population.
as organisms enter and leave a population, they're carrying with them their genes, and that allows us to mix. Now, migration does tend to homogenize populations. That is, each population is specialized for its particular environment. And since the population is mating within itself, then those favorable traits increase in frequency. Now all of a sudden, if I have population A and population B, and I have gene flow between them, now I no longer have just the genes that have become favorable for A staying in A. And we tend to homogenize. It tends to eliminate differences between populations when we have high levels of immigration. The third factor we're going to talk about that can influence a population and cause change is non-random mating. Non-random mating comes in two different varieties. The first is inbreeding, where closely related individuals produce offspring. And then we have sexual selection, which can be broken into two different types. It can be um, male competition. for females or territory, or female choice. And while male competi competition was easily accepted by Darwin's contemporaries because it was very easy for them to conceptualize, conceptualize, female choice was a lot harder to convince them of because far be it from me or females to have the ability to affect change in a population. But in fact, we see this time and time again. Now let's take a closer look at each of these. A great example of inbreeding and the consequences of it um, can be seen in the Blue Fugates of Kentucky. So Martin Fugate, who was an orphan, came with his bride and um, set up their home on the banks of Troublesome Creek. Well, there weren't a lot of roads coming into and out of Troublesome Creek. So a lot of inbreeding occurred over the generations because the Fugates intermarried. Now, there's normally a recessive disease called methoglo methoglobinemia and Martin carried it. But over time, more than just Martin was feeling a little bit blue. And you can see here, these are the blue fugates of Kentucky. Methoglo methoglobinemia is a recessive trait, normally very rare in the population. With inbreeding, because closely related individuals are mating and producing offspring together, if there's a rare trait present in that family, well, through just sexual reproduction, that recessive trait, even though it's rare in the population at large, becomes much more pronounced, simply because there's less genetic diversity in the population to begin with. So again, the disorder is methoglobinemia, and it causes an enzyme deficiency, which causes a bluish color to the skin. Um, and it is a recessive trait that was became a lot more um, pervasive in this one group. So that's an example of inbreeding. And now lots of organisms inbreed in nature. Plants can cross-pollinate and sometimes um, self-pollinate, although in order to maintain genetic diversity that there are lots of mechanisms to prevent that. But um, closely related individuals, this is not a rare occurrence in nature. The other type of sexual selection or non-random mating is in sexual selection. And sexual selection is when we have differential reproductive su success, either based on male, cho male competition or female choice. So this is when an individual is going to choose a mate from a set of potential mates, and not everyone gets to reproduce. So in female choice, which we would call intersexual selection, okay, inter because it's between the two sexes, between male and female, the females are going to choose mates, and they're going to choose it on characteristics which are an indicator of their fitness. And in order for this to spread, we want to make sure that this trait is an honest indicator of fitness. So for example, um, females choosing based on coloration or plumage, choosing based on the complexity of a, a bird call or song or some kind of courtship display that uh, an organism may do. These are all indicators. Also choosing based on size or um, kind of their, their overall demonstration of their fitness. In order for these traits to spread through the population, that trait that the female is using to choose from has to be an honest indicator. So for example, classic example, peacock's tail, right? Male peacocks, the bigger, the brighter the tail. Females prefer that. Now in order for 
bigger breader tails to persist in the population, it has to truly indicate that that male peacock is really um, fit and very well suited for the environment that it's able to get enough nutrition to support that tail, that it has the skills to avoid predators, all of those things. And if that is an honest indicator that females are basing their choice on, then we'll see that spread through the population. The other type of um, sexual selection is male competition. And this is intrasexual because it's between the males. So this, the classic example of this, is the bighorn sheep running towards each other, cracking horns, right, in order to um, establish territories or establish a group of females and lay claim to those. So this is when the males are facing off with one another in order to establish um, territory and reproductive rights. Now, take a second. Go to PBS, their evolution website, and make sure you check out the video clip on the peacock's tail. If you're in my biology class, go right on to Moodle and go to the folder linked um, evolution video clips and make sure you check out the peacock's tail because it's a really fabulous little clip demonstrating what Darwin thought about sexual selection and the problems it posed to his theory on natural selection. Turns out natural selection is not the be-all and end-all and that sexual selection is a really important factor driving animal diversity as well. Now the fourth factor we're going to talk about is genetic drift. And genetic drift is due more to chance than the other factors. In genetic drift, by chance, some individuals survive and reproduce. So this reproduction and this success isn't due to any particular phenotype that the organism displays. It's simply due to chance. So if you imagine a field of flowers, and over time, we have our different frequencies here. Recall that we're going back to our frequencies because they're going to indicate whether we're still in or we're moving out of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And out of these flowers, Several of them were stomped on and destroyed by pure chance, not because of the color they were, not because of any particular factor, just because of pure chance. And so in fact, what we have persisting here, so if we stomp out some of our flowers, then just the ones that are survive now have the capability of reproducing. And they're reproducing, again, based on chance, not because they possess anything that makes them more fit or better suited for their environment. So now we have five plants that remain. Well, what if two more of those plants are, or more of those plants get stomped on and picked or um, get wiped out in a flood? Again, the ones that survive are surviving by pure chance. And if you see what we've done, the alleles that are going to get passed on from generation to generation are random. It's pure chance. It's simply because they survived. And again, not due to any kind of phenotype they display. And what we've effectively done is we've weeded out the recessive allele from this population. Not because the recessive was less fit, simply because the plants that survived being picked, survived the storm, survived the flood, did not carry that recessive trait. Now, genetic drift has two kind of classic ways that it can happen either via the founder effect or the bottleneck effect. The founder effect occurs when a small population colonizes a new habitat with a variety of niches. So a great example of this would be um, a, a group of birds being blown off course and making it to an island where there were very few species living or where there are available niches. So birds from the mainland blown to an island. Now, because only a few birds make it to the island, they don't necessarily have alleles that represent the entire population of, say, I don't know, finches. And because they don't represent all of those, now I might have a disproportionately high frequency of alleles that really aren't representative of the entire population. 
because those few birds are now on this island with very little competition oftentimes, now they're surviving and reproducing and establishing a new population. That new population is established based on the alleles that those birds carried. Not that they were the best alleles, not that they were the most favorable, but simply that those are the birds that were blown to this island by chance and then now have established a new population. Once that population is underway, the other factors like sexual selection and natural selection again are going to come into play, but that initial founding population is due simply to the chance that they were blown there. Bottleneck effect is similar. In the bottleneck effect, um, a population is greatly reduced in size. And because that population is so drastically reduced in size, again, those few individuals that have survived may not be representative of the alleles of the entire larger, let's say, metapopulation. Just those ones that happen to escape the drought or escape um, the natural disaster that had nothing to do with their fitness, nothing to do with their traits that they did carry, because those few survived, they are now going to establish that new population. So this is a really great visual of that. So we have these random changes that are due to this population size. So imagine the bottleneck here. So imagine the bottleneck here. If we're looking at this, only a few of these beads are actually making it through the bottleneck because it's so narrow. Now you can see in here that we have other traits. We have this yellow allele. It looks like we have pretty equal numbers of the blue and the white alleles. But that may not be what gets dumped out of the bottle. In fact, way more in this example here of the blue alleles have survived than the white. That means that when this then goes on to start a new population, we don't necessarily have the same frequency of alleles we had in the larger population. And that may cause some drastic changes. A great example of this are the cheetahs that live in the African rim craters. Um, the diversity of the cheetah was greatly wiped out very few survived, and now those few have gone on to establish the new populations that are there. So the last one we're going to talk about that factor that contributes to population change is natural selection. And natural selection is the only one of these factors that leads to adaptive change over time. Okay? It's non-random differential survival and reproduction of individuals who are carrying alternative inherited traits. Okay, what does that mean? What it means is survival of the fittest that not everybody not everyone is created equal some have a better combination of traits which allow them to survive in that environment those that have the best combinations of traits are going to survive because they have enough resources they have enough food and they're going to mate and because those traits are heritable they can then be passed on to their offspring who also have those traits so in order for natural selection to happen recall that we need a few things we need overproduction of offspring which leads to competition we need variation present in the population we need the traits to be heritable and there needs to be this non-random, this differential survival so that not all traits are created equal. Some actually convey an advantage. Okay. It results in a change in the frequency of alleles over time and therefore the change in genotypes over time and allows organisms to become more suited for their environment. It's based on those differences in fitness. And the differences in fitness come from the variation that's present in those alleles. And last but not least, it's the only mechanism that's going to consistently give rise to adaptive evolution. Remember, natural selection isn't crafting perfect organisms. It's not a creative process. It's an editing process. It takes the variation that's in there that's been shuffled up through meiosis and random fertilization, crossing over all of those things and sexual reproduction, and it weeds out the combination of phenotypes that aren't suited, that aren't adapted for the environment. And so only the phenotypes that are really well suited are going to remain and then pass on their traits to their offspring. So there's three different kinds of natural selection really at work here, right? Natural selection can act as a stabilizing factor, it can act in one direction, or it can disrupt a population. And these can all give rise, again, to speciation if we're thinking ahead. So if we consider this population of mice here, and there's a variation in fur color, and we see that the majority of the population is right here in the middle. In stabilizing selection, the extremes 
are selected against and the average trait is favorable. Therefore, the average trait will increase in frequency in that population. In directional selection, you guessed it, we're moving in a direction. So in directional selection, one extreme is unfavorable, so its traits and its frequency decreases, but the other extreme is favorable, and so the population will move in that direction. In disruptive selection, we're going to disrupt the population, and the average trait is selected against where the extremes are selected for. And which one of these scenarios plays out completely depends upon the environment. It depends what the environment has to offer and how the organism is making use of the resources that are available there. Great example of directional selection can be found in peppered moths. So if you look on this tree here, can you find the peppered moths? Well, one of them is going to stick out like a sore thumb, this dark moth moth right here. The light moth is really well camouflaged. It blends in beautifully. And so if you're a predator like a bird who's relying on its visual system in order to hunt, who are you going to eat? You're not going to spend time looking around for the delicacy of a light colored moth. You're going to eat the insect that is readily available. And in fact, that would be the dark colored moth in this scenario. So over time, you can imagine if the light favored moth is favored, we're going to move the population so that more and more light colored moths are present. Why? Simply because the light-colored ones are surviving to reproduce and pass on that trait. But what if the environment changes? Well, if the environment changes, the traits that were once favored may no longer be favorable. And in fact, we can see that here. After the Industrial Revolution in Europe, um, there was a lot of pollution, a lot of soot on the trees, that sort of thing, and it changed the color of the bark. And so where the once the light-colored moths were really well camouflaged, now the darker moths are the ones that are better camouflaged. And so if you're a visual predator again, you're going to go after the moth you can see and we see this huge decrease, decrease in the frequency of the light colored moths and instead we move towards the dark colored moths. So again, a change in one direction favoring the extreme, in this case the darker phenotype, a change over time. Stabilizing selection on the other hand is working to select the the average, the average trait. And we see this in birth weight. In birth weight in humans, there is a consequence for having a really low birth weight, and that's increased mortality. There's also a consequence in really high birth weight, um, not necessarily for the offspring, but for the mother, perhaps. Um, if you recall, I mean, we don't think about it a lot now, but Childbirth is extremely dangerous, uh, and if we think about uh, maybe less industrialized countries where medicine isn't as freely available, or even think back in our history, um, that one of the number one, I'm sorry, one of the most um, prevalent killers of women was um, death in childbirth. That was not an uncommon occurrence because if something went wrong, there was very little medical intervention at the time to save both the infant and the mother's life. And so we see the stabilizing where we have these two factors that are playing out. High infant mortality from a low birth weight, high potential um, maternal mortality from um, a really high birth weight. And so if those two are less favored, then what we will favor is that average trait, which gives the baby the best chance at survival. The mother um, has the opportunity to have that child and not um, perhaps pass away in childbirth, which means a more successful pregnancy, which means a more successful delivery, which in turn can contribute to that higher um, life, um, that lower, I'm sorry, mortality for that child. In stabilizing selection, recall that those extremes are selected against. They are less favorable, less fit than the um, average trait. Last but not least, in disruptive selection, disruptive selection is going to favor the organisms with the extreme traits and selects against those in that more average, the normal part of the distribution.
And this can actually give rise to new species because if we're selecting the extremes, they may have different physiological characteristics, they may have different behaviors that are going to help to isolate the populations from one another. And this would happen in these instances, this average trait must um, not have the same advantages at, of the two extremes. So again, important pieces to remember. Natural selection does not make perfect organisms. Um, evolution and natural selection are constrained by historical constraints. We can't fashion something brand new. We're a product of what has come before us. And last but not least, adaptations are often compromises. So there's often a cost towards having that advantage. Um, if you think back to um, the garter snakes and the rough-skinned newts that are present in Oregon, the rough-skinned newts who are extremely toxic and the garter snakes who are resistant to it. And yet, there's a cost for that garter snake to be resistant to consuming that newt. And the cost is that it's much slower overall, um, which makes it an easier prey item for many predators. So there's a balancing act here. Adaptations often have a compromise. It doesn't fashion the perfect organism. It's not the best um, scenario out there. But it's constrained by its history and it's constrained by the existing variation. It's an editing mechanism, not a creative mechanism.